Hello and welcome to the second video of the FP2 chapter Further Argand Diagrams. On the screen, a quick starter to review what we did in the last video. What do each of these loci represent? The first one is a circle, center Z1 radius A. The second one is a perpendicular bisector of the line segment Z1, Z2. And the third one is a circle with an unknown center and radius that you would have to find using the algebraic method that we looked at in the last video. These three are all to do with the modulus symbols. In this video, we're going to look at two more and they are going to focus around the argument. So here are our three results so far. Standard result number four. So here, if Z is variable, what does Z minus Z1 represent? Here is Z1, it's a fixed point. Z over here is variable. So if you remember your vector work, you should remember that Z minus Z1 is the vector that goes this direction, from Z1 to Z. Now if we take the argument of that vector, which is the angle it makes with the positive real axis, and we fix that as a constant alpha, what we get is a half line from Z1 going this direction. It goes forever in this direction, but it does not go in this direction. So it starts here and goes up. So this is our fourth standard result, a half line from Z1 at an angle alpha with the positive real axis. Now it's worth noting here, I've drawn this with a little open circle. That's because Z1 itself is not included in the locus. So draw that with a little open circle like you have done before with inequalities. An example of how this might look is something like this, where again we need to be careful with that negative. So what I would do is rewrite this as z minus 5 plus i in order to be clear what the point z1 is. Here the point is 5 plus i, so we've got 5, 1. So the bit you need to draw here is in grey. You don't need this, you don't need this, you just need the open circle a little horizontal dashed line so that you can put in the angle here and the half line drawn up like that. Write in the angle itself to complete it. That's a key piece of information and you could put on the coordinates of Z1 as well. We can apply the same algebraic method, putting in X plus Y I for Z, collecting real and imaginary parts and then manipulating it to get a Cartesian equation of this half line. But I'm not going to do that in this example because this process takes a little bit longer with the arguments, so I'll leave that for the examples at the end of the video. Fifth and final standard result is a little bit more involved. We take two of these to begin with. So the argument of Z minus Z1 is equal to alpha. So that's just what we had on the previous screen. And then the argument of Z minus Z2 is equal to beta. So that's the second one. Same Z, variable, different fixed point and a different angle. So if we put those two on our diagram, Z here is variable and it's where these two cross because both of these need to be true at the same time. Then we look at the angle involved here. And if you do a little bit of alternate angles work, you can see that this angle here is alpha minus beta. But alpha minus beta is also equal to the argument of Z minus Z1 from here minus the argument of Z minus Z2 from here. Next, we replace alpha minus beta with the single angle theta. We also need to remember that the argument of a complex number minus the argument of another complex number can be written as the argument of the first one divided by the second one. Putting that with this allows us to write this statement here, and this is the locus format you need to be familiar with. The argument of z minus z1 divided by z minus z2, where z1 and z2 are both fixed points, is equal to theta, where theta is going to be a fixed constant like alpha in the previous one, which means we have to ask ourselves if z can vary, but z1, z2 and theta are all fixed, what different points could z take? And the answer to that links back with some of your GCSE work on circle theorem because if we have an arc from Z1 to Z2, you know that all the angles on the arc made from Z1 and Z2 are equal. 
and that's how we get our constant of theta. So this is our fifth and final standard result. There's a little bit more to remember about it. It describes an arc going anti-clockwise from Z1 to Z2. That's useful to remember because although you can work it out with the angles, it gets a bit confusing sometimes. And there are other possibilities here. You could have one here. You could have the rest of this circle here, the minor arc, or the minor arc from the circle on the other side going this way. So there are four different bits, this, 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 or this. Deciding which one is the correct one can be awkward. I find it better just to remember it goes anti-clockwise from Z1 to Z2, which could be this or could be this. And then, of course, the angle will tell you whether it's a large angle or a smaller angle. And again, Z1 and Z2 are not included in the locus. You can convince yourself of that very quickly. If you put Z1 in here, you get a zero. And if you put a Z2 in here, then it's undefined. So another quick example is something like this. Or again, be careful with your negatives. Z1 is 5 plus i here. And Z2 is 1 plus 4i here. And then pi by 6 is not this part of a circle. It's this part of the circle. And it's going anticlockwise from Z1 to Z2. So it's this direction, not this direction. And again, you can go through the algebraic process to find the Cartesian equation of this part of the circle. But I won't do that on this example because we're just about to do it on the next one. And they're quite long, so I only want to do one of those in this video. So our final summary of all five results is here. You need to be able to recognize the different formats and you need to remember what those different formats represent in terms of a locus on an argan diagram. You need to be able to sketch the locus, and you might have to find the Cartesian equation, in which case you follow that same process we've done each time. Final two examples, one for this and one for this, using that same process. On an argan diagram, sketch the locus of each of these, and I'll also find the Cartesian equations. So for part A, we've got a half line. It is coming from 2 minus i. And usually I would do this, but in this case I need to be careful to have an open circle. Put the locus in green. And compared with the positive real axis direction, I need to have an angle of pi by 3. Now this is positive, so it's going anti-clockwise. And pi by 3 is 60 degrees, so it's coming out here. Don't forget to label the angle. But in this case, I won't put the coordinates of the point because I've already got them on the axes here. OK, the interesting part. Can we get a Cartesian equation of this line? And the answer to that is we can, using that same process, as I've said. Replace the z with an x plus yi, as before. And then collect the real and imaginary parts, as before. And then we remember what it means to find the argument of a complex number. To find the argument of a complex number, you do the inverse tan of the imaginary part divided by the real part. So we go ahead and we do that. The inverse tan of the imaginary part, y plus 1, divided by the real part, x minus 2, and we're told that must equal pi by 3. Now I can take the tan on the other side, do the tangent of pi by 3, which is the square root of 3, and then just rearrange what we've got left to find our line equation in its usual form. In this case, I'll write y equals mx plus c form. So this is the Cartesian equation of this line here. But it's actually the Cartesian equation of the full line going forever in both directions. And we only want a half line. So to make that really clear, I'm going to say x needs to be bigger than 2. Just to be clear, it's a half line. Part b, questions like this are a bit more involved. They're a bit longer, but it's exactly the same idea. We'll have an argument, we'll put in x plus yi for z's, we'll need to find a single complex number format, a real part plus an imaginary part, 
and then do the inverse tan real divided by imaginary is equal to the angle given. Go ahead and rearrange and get your circle equation. But the reason it's more complicated is because there's a divide symbol in here, which means getting a complex number x plus y i format here is a bit more involved. So let's jump right in and get it done. So here we've got a slightly easier complex number. We've just got 2i. And here as well, slightly easier, minus 3. Now again, I've got four options. I've got an arc of a circle that goes here, an arc of a circle that goes here, the arc of a circle that goes here, and the arc of a circle that goes here. To decide which one of those, I need to remember I go anti-clockwise from Z1, the one in the numerator, to Z2, the one in the denominator. So I need to start here and go anti-clockwise. So either it's this one or it's this one. To decide which one, this obviously has an angle greater than pi by 2, whereas this is obviously less than pi by 2. So it must be the bigger arc. Something like this. Now comes the fun part. And what I'm going to do is actually get rid of this diagram because I'm going to need all the space I've got. So we go for z as x plus yi. both the numerator and the denominator. Collect the real and imaginary parts. Now this is the extra bit compared with the previous example. We can't do the inverse tan of the imaginary part divided by the real part here because we don't know what the imaginary part and the real part is of this full complex number. We're going to need to rearrange. So as an aside, let's deal with this. So we've got x plus i y minus 2 over x plus 3 plus y i. To write this as a single complex number, we need to multiply that by x plus 3 minus y i, top and bottom. And as usual, the reason we do that is because this times this minus this times this disappear. And when we multiply this by this, the imaginary part disappears. So in the denominator, we end up with x plus 3 squared plus y squared. And in the numerator, we get whatever we get. Plus i times y minus 2x plus 3, and then minus xy. So that's a bit of a mess. And we've got a big old fraction still. So to split this into real and imaginary, I'm going to separate the fraction, keeping the same denominator, of course, for both parts. So that gives us x, x plus 3, plus y, y minus 2, all divided by x plus 3 squared plus y squared, and that's the real part. And then we have y minus 2, x plus 3 minus xy, all divided by x plus 3 squared plus y squared, and that is the imaginary part. Now that's a pretty horrible looking complex number. But we have the real part, and we have the imaginary part, and it is a single complex number in the argument here, replacing this fraction. So now I can apply my inverse tan. So going back to white, we've got the inverse tan of the imaginary part divided by the real part, but because they've got the same denominator, it's just this divided by this. So it's not quite as bad as it seems. that has to equal pi by 4. Now we bring the tan on the other side, and tan of pi by 4 is just 1, so this has to equal 1. 
and if this equals 1, then I can take the denominator on the other side. The numerator must equal the denominator. So doing all of that in one go, we get this. I will just expand everything out and simplify, hoping that this xy term disappears, because I don't want that in a circle equation. And we can see straight away it will xy minus 2x plus 3y minus 6 minus xy is equal to x squared plus 3x plus y squared minus 2y. Collecting everything and simplifying, that cancels with that. x squared plus 5x plus y squared minus 5y plus 6 equals 0. Then complete the square as usual to get our final answer. Throw those numbers on the other side. And we have our circle equation. So the center point is at minus 5 over 2, 5 over 2, and the radius is equal to the square root of 13 over 2. That was quite a long process, and I hope you can see that if these complex numbers z1 and z2 weren't as simple as this, it would be an even longer process because you would have all of those brackets coming up in these places again, making this expression more complicated and therefore this expression and therefore all of the algebra that follows. But even if it's more complicated than this, it's the same process. Follow it through, be careful of your algebra, and you should get the correct answer. That should be enough for you to have a go at all of the questions from exercise 4a and 4b but I've said more of them rather than all of them, because in the next video I'll go through a lot of the textbook examples and give you an idea for some of the more problem-solving elements. So you might want to hold out for that. Maybe I'll see you there.